The Daedra are some of the most powerful beings in the Elder Scrolls series and are sure to play important roles in the Elder Scrolls 6 and beyond. In light of this, the purpose of this video series is to discuss the Daedric Princes and their potential involvement in future Elder Scrolls games. For a more in-depth explanation of this series, I suggest checking out episodes 1 and 2 where I explain my criteria for evaluating each of the Princes, assigning important scores, and other things. But regardless, in today's episode I'll be covering the following Daedric Princes, Namira, Periite, and Sanguine. First up is Namira, the Daedric Prince of Shadow and Ancient Darkness. Her primary artifact is the Ring of Namira, which was available in both Oblivion and Skyrim. There's a good chance it'll be available again via Daedric side quest in the Elder Scrolls 6 and beyond, given that it was available in the two most recent Elder Scrolls games, and it will likely grant bonuses related to cannibalism, just like it did in Oblivion and Skyrim. Namira is the patron of Tamriel's cannibals, and this will likely be an important plot point in future quests involving Namira. In Skyrim, the quest to obtain Namira's ring involved a cult of cannibals, and something akin to this idea could return in future games. In fact, Bethesda could even go so far as to introduce an all-new major faction that is cannibalistic in nature, in which case Namira would undoubtedly play an important role in the faction's storyline. Namira is also the patron of Tamriel's beggars. The book Beggar Prince tells of a prince in Valenwood who is given three blessings or powers from Namira, these powers being disease, pity, and disregard. Using Namira's blessings, he became a legendary beggar known as the Prince of Beggars. Namira's three powers could return in a major way in future games. Specifically, I believe a new artifact of Namira based on one or all of these powers could be introduced in the future. Moreover, Namira being the patron of beggars introduces the possibility of a major beggar faction that worships Namira. There are two provinces in which I could see Namira playing a major role in the main quest. First is the Black Marsh, which is dark and full of repulsive things, so Namira having a major role would complement the province's atmosphere quite well. The second province is Valenwood. The Bosmer are bound by the Green Pact to only consume meat, and as such are carnivores and cannibals, and in fact they even have a ritual called the Wild Hunt that permanently transforms all participants into mindless, bloodthirsty monsters who first consume all of their enemies, and then themselves. So Given that Namira is the patron of cannibals, she could be connected to the Bosmer or involved in this ritual in some way. Namira also dealt with the Prince of Valenwood in the past, so her somehow being involved with the royal family in a future game would be a nice parallel to past events. Namira's realm has been referred to as the Scuttling Void. We know almost nothing about the Scuttling Void, and in fact the name Scuttling Void itself comes from out of game lore, so we technically don't even know the canon name for Namira's realm just yet. Given Namira's sphere, her realm will likely be full of repulsive things such as disease and cannibalism, and will have some sort of connection to ancient darkness. I could also see Bethesda incorporating some horror elements into the realm for a DLC or quest set here. With regards to the likelihood of the Scuttling Void appearing in future games, I believe there's a somewhat high chance, because on the one hand it would fit in well with the atmosphere of the Black Marsh, but one could also make the argument it would provide a nice contrast with the Somerset Isles in Valenwood, and in the case of Valenwood, would keep up with the theme of cannibalism. So for games set in any of these provinces, there are fair arguments for the Scuttling Void making an appearance. Overall, Namira and her realm have a fair amount of potential, but much is unknown about them, so Namira gets an important score of 3 out of 5. Next up is Periite, the Daedric Prince of Pestilence and Natural Order. Periite's only known artifact is Spellbreaker, a shield that protects against magic and is one of the few artifacts to appear in all main series Elder Scrolls games. As a fairly iconic artifact, I'm certain it will appear in the Elder Scrolls 6 and beyond. Spellbreaker was forged by the Dwemer King Rorkin, but eventually fell into Periite's hands for unknown reasons. In light of this, one interesting idea for a future quest would be an investigation of Spellbreaker's past, in which case we would learn more about the Dwemer, how Spellbreaker came into Periite's possession, and any possible connections between Periite and the Dwemer. 
Periite is considered one of the weakest Daedric princes, but I believe there's much more to him than meets the eye. I say this because he appears as a dragon and resembles Akatosh, who is one of the most important figures in the Elder Scrolls. One source, albeit an out-of-game source, explicitly remarks on this connection, claiming followers of Periite ought to regard his resemblance to Akatosh as a jest. This connection to Akatosh has a lot of potential, and Bethesda could craft a pretty fascinating storyline for a DLC, or possibly even a future main quest around it. For example, we already know of Aedra that have been transformed into Daedra in the past, such as Meridia and Malakath. So what if Periite were once a powerful child of Akatosh, but fell and became a Daedra? This is nothing more than an example to illustrate my point and is probably unlikely, but the point is there are a lot of interesting things that could be done with Periite. Periite also has a connection to Kine, as she gives him the souls of Skeevers when they die, which could be brought up as a minor point in the future. As the Daedric Prince of Pestilence, Periite is responsible for many plagues and diseases in Tamriel. The Slode, who are slug-like creatures that inhabit the kingdom of Thras to the west of the Somerset Isles, also have a connection to disease, and were responsible for engineering a plague that killed over half of Tamriel's population many years ago. Given this, there could be a connection between Periite and the Slode. The Slode are almost certain to appear for a game set in the Somerset Isles, given how much they've clashed with the Ultimer in the past, so perhaps the hypothetical connection between Periite and the Slode could be an important part of the main quest for a game set in the Ultimer province. Periite is known as the Taskmaster, and maintains the order of Lesser Daedra in Oblivion. This could become a major plot point at some point in the future as well. Perhaps some event or conflict involving Periite will disrupt the order of Lesser Daedra, and the player will somehow be involved in this conflict. Periite's realm is called the Pits. They supposedly appeared in Oblivion and resembled Maroon's Dagon's realm, but to make a long story short, there are some complications with that, and that's probably not how it's going to end up looking if we see the realm again. We don't know enough about the Pits to speculate on whether it would be a good setting, but given how interesting Periite himself is, I do believe that a large-scale DLC set here would be a lot of fun. In sum, there's so much more to Periite than meets the eye, so he gets an important score of 4. Last is Sanguine, the prince of hedonistic revelry, debauchery, and passionate indulgences of darker natures. Sanguine's most well-known artifact is the Sanguine Rose, which appeared in Daggerfall, Oblivion, and Skyrim. Like Spellbreaker, it too is an iconic item, and will likely be obtainable in The Elder Scrolls VI and future games beyond that. In all three games it's appeared in, it has summoned a lesser Daedra to fight for the player, and this effect will likely remain the same. Sanguine once created a group of artifacts called the 27 Threads of the Web Spinner for Mephala to bestow upon the Morag Tong. These artifacts technically belong to Mephala and not Sanguine, but if they did reappear in a future game, Sanguine's name could at least be brought up again. Sanguine is allied with Vermina and appears to be on good terms with Mephala, so if there were ever some sort of large-scale conflict between the Daedra, Sanguine, Vermina, and Mephala could establish some sort of alliance. Sanguine is the enemy of Mara, the goddess of love, and this conflict could become important in a future game as well. Sanguine's realms are called the Myriad Realms of Revelry. They are a group of connected pocket realms and smaller subplanes rather than a single plane. These realms are constantly changing to meet the desires of whoever visits them, meaning Sanguine ironically has little control over his own realm. Because the myriad realms of revelry are so fractured, they're a slightly poor location for a large-scale DLC, as they'd be very awkward to explore. However, it's certainly not impossible, and there are ways Bethesda could make it work. Overall, Sanguine gets an important score of 2. This might seem a bit harsh, but Sanguine just isn't that interesting in comparison to other princes. His realm doesn't have that much potential, and his artifact is rather boring, since all it does is summon a lesser Daedra, which can already be done via Conjuration. The only reason he gets a 2 as opposed to a 1 is potential involvement with other Daedra and Daedra. Alright everyone, that's going to do it for the video. I hope you enjoyed this discussion, and if so, be sure to leave a like as it greatly helps me out. Also feel free to share your thoughts on the Daedric Princes discussed in this video, and the roles they could play going forward in the future. Otherwise, thanks again for watching, and have a great day.